This is a reading of Dr. Rob Kim Henderson's article, Understanding the Young Male Syndrome. Uh, subscribe to Dr. Henderson's newsletter at robkhenderson.com. Below is a transcript of a lecture he recently delivered at the University of Richmond. Thank you to everyone who has helped me organize this event. It's a real honor to be with you all. I'm here in my capacity as a psychologist and author to speak about what social scientists have termed the young male syndrome. Behind such concepts are flesh and blood human beings with their own unique stories and experiences. Psychology and the social sciences more broadly are useful for describing aggregate patterns and identifying the causes and effects behind them. But it can fall short when it comes to acknowledging the depth and rich complexity of people's actual lives. So before I delve into the theoretical and empirical work underlying the young male syndrome, I'll begin by just briefly speaking about my own unusual life, which can be understood through the origins of my name, Robert Kim Henderson. All three of my names were taken from different adults. Robert Kim comes from my supposed biological father. Until recently, the only information I had about him is his name from a document provided by a social worker responsible for my case when I was a foster child. I recently took a 23andMe DNA test and discovered that I am half Hispanic on my father's side. My middle name, Kim, comes from my biological mother, who has moved from South Korea to Los Angeles when I was born. Kim was her family name. She succumbed to drug addiction, rendering her unable to care for me, and I was subsequently placed in the foster care system in LA. And my last name, Henderson, it comes from my former adoptive father. After my adoptive mother left him, he severed ties with me in order to hurt her. He figured that my emotional pain from his desertion would be transmitted to my adoptive mother. He was right. As you might imagine, these were extremely difficult experiences for me. My life temporarily improved, though, when my adoptive mother entered a relationship with a woman named Shelley. Together they created a relatively stable home for my adoptive sister and me during my adolescence in a dusty blue-collar town in Northern California called Red Bluff. When I was in eighth grade, my mom and Shelley bought me bought some lumber when they learned that heating a house with firewood was less expensive than central heating. I spent several hours one afternoon stacking the oak and cedar logs next to our little shed in the backyard. That year I woke up at 5.30 a.m. every morning to build a fire so that the house would be warm by the time my moms got up and get ready for work at 7 a.m. I did this all winter when temperatures would dip into the low 30s. Frosty weather for Californians. At first I'd argue with my moms about my new chore. Shelley calmly replied that she and my mom worked all day to pay the bills and that helping to keep the house warm was the least I could do as the, quote, man of the house. At age 13, this was the first time anyone had ever described me as a man, and I implicitly grasped that it had something to do with responsibility and contribution. My hope is that by the end of this discussion of the young male syndrome, we'll have a fuller understanding of the message my two moms were trying to convey to my 13-year-old self. Of course, there are many ways of understanding what being a man is about, and there are many valid reason, ways to be a man. However, regardless of how it is expressed, it usually has something to do with strength and toughness and productivity. In his cross-cultural research, the psychologist Seeger has found three consistent requirements to achieve the status of manhood in various societies around the world. First, the individual must be a fighter and a winner. Second, he must be a provider and a protector. And third, he must maintain mastery and control of himself at all times. Across cultures, there seems to be an implicit understanding of what being a man is. Instead, indeed, in a widely cited study of 25 cultures, including New Zealand, Finland, Malaysia, Pakistan, and Bolivia, Zimbabwe, and Trinidad, definitions of masculinity and femininity hardly fluctuated at all. As a rule, participants in this study said they did not believe that men and women differed in all respects, but they did not view one sex as inherently superior to the other. And in every culture, men were seen as active, adventurous, dominant, forceful, independent, and strong. Contemporary polemicists will rhetorically ask questions like, what is a woman? But seldom does anyone ask, what is a man? People seem to already know. Indeed, many individuals resort to commonplace expressions such as man up, be a man, or more crassly, grow some balls. In polite society, people won't publicly express such remarks, but many will still think them. Men, of course, are responsible to these statements, responsive to these statements. In a famous literary illustration, Shakespeare's Lady Macbeth reinforces the conception of manhood as strength. Early on in the 17th century play, she receives a letter from her husband. The letter details an encounter with three witches and their prophecy that her husband, Macbeth, will take over the throne from King Duncan. Lady Macbeth is eager for this power and insists that she and her husband must murder the king themselves in order for this prophecy to come true. Lady Macbeth expresses her concerns, however, when she grows worried about whether her husband will be manly enough to follow through with this agreement. 
Her fears are confirmed when Macbeth, upon reflecting on the consequences of treason, subsequently backs out of the plan. Lady Macbeth then persuades her husband when she proclaims that if he were to go through with the murder, murder, then he would not only be a man, but so much more. By dangling the enticing reputation of manliness over her husband, Lady Macbeth succeeds in getting him to kill the king and subsequently sets in motion the chaotic events of the rest of the play. Shakespeare was clearly a keen observer of human nature in general and of men's anxieties about their masculinity in particular. Such anxieties regarding the belief that manhood is something that must be achieved through action appear to be ubiquitous around the world. On the Greek Aegean island of Calamos, for example, many of the inhabitants make their living by commercial sponge fishing. The men dive deep into the water with the aid of special equipment, which they scorn, without the aid of special equipment, which they scorn. Diving is a gamble because many men are stricken and injured. Young divers who take precautions are mocked as effeminate and ridiculed by their peers. Halfway around the world in the high mountains of Melanesia, young boys undergo intense trials for achieving the status of manhood. Young boys are torn from their mothers and forced to undergo a series of brutal masculinizing rituals. These include whippings, beatings, and other forms of terror from older men, which the boys must endure stoically and silently. This community believes that without such hazing, boys will never mature into men but remain weak and childlike. Real men are made, they insist, not born. To this extent, the psychologist Dr. Roy Bomeister has pointed out that, quote, in many societies, any girl who grows up automatically becomes a woman. Meanwhile, a boy does not automatically become a man, and instead is often required to prove himself, usually by passing stringent tests or producing more than he consumes. In many non-industrialized small-scale societies, girls are believed to become women when they are physically able to produce children. The ability to have kids is considered a major contrib contribution in itself to the community. Boys, in contrast, do not have a clear and visible biological indicator of manhood and must often endure culturally sanctioned rituals and painful trials to become men. Indeed, masculinity is widely considered to be an artificially induced status, achievable only through testing and careful instruction. Real men do not simply emerge like butterflies from their boyish cocoons. Rather, they must be carefully shaped nurtured, counseled, and prodded into manhood. The literary critic Alfred Haybegger has remarked that masculinity has an uncertain and ambiguous status. It is not something to be acquired through a struggle, a painful initiation, or a long, sometimes humiliating apprenticeship. It is something to be acquired through those means. Let's now consider an indigenous community located in Brazil. I'm going to dwell on this society at some length because they're explicitly and self-consciously a nonviolent society. The tribe goes out of its way to maintain peace with neighboring communities that are more aggressive and confrontational, yet even this community exhibits familiar patterns regarding cultural conceptions of masculinity and manhood. The tribe reside among impassable streams and waterfalls, making their ter territory inaccessible to all but the most determined outsiders. They depend on river and lake fish for protein, and the men are expected to go on long fishing expeditions to distant waters over rough and hazardous terrain, sometimes for days or weeks. The tribal men are very concerned about their manhood. For them, manliness is a status equivalent to the highest social virtue. A man's prestige comes not necessarily from being a good man in some abstract moral sense, but from being good at being a man. This entails living up to the three rules I mentioned before regarding provisioning, protection, and mastery, as documented by Seeger. The tribal men earn their laurels by trying to outperform the others in fishing prowess and in accumulating property such as tools and other goods. The community judges a man's industriousness his willingness to go on long and arduous fishing trips to distant lakes and streams, often over treacherous terrain where rival coalitions might ambush and attack them. A fear of economic inadequacy haunts these men. They experience intense anxiety about appearing slothful and lethargic. When a man returns from a dangerous fishing expedition, he is expected to appear immediately in the village plaza, plaza where, men, where people gather expectantly. He then ostentatiously displays his catch before distributing it unsparingly. The anthropologist Gilmore describes the norm within a community, noting that the hallmark of a real man is that he is selfless. He always shares his food. In contrast, men who are stingy are seen as parasitic and despised as freeloaders. The tribal people instill a hard sense of work, civic duty, and the conventional understanding of manliness into little boys. For example, if a boy sleeps in late or lounges about or refuses to accompany his father on the fishing expeditions, he is mocked and called a little girl. Moreover, a boy is often warned that if he is lazy, then when he grows up, he will be undesirable to women. 
Thus, this community has managed to ignite the cauldron of young male energy and channel it away from warfare with neighboring communities and towards economic productivity, industriousness, and generosity, with a coinciding decrease in desirability to potential romantic partners. As mentioned, the tribal people fight no wars and are regarded as a nonviolent society. Interestingly, though, they regularly organize wrestling matches in which strict rules of decorum are observed. Their wrestling is known to be spirited and aggressive, but results in few injuries other than minor scrapes and bruises. The men try to defeat one another in these organized contests, and winners receive the respect of the community. All men are expected to wrestle, to give their best effort, and if possible, to win. Avoiding participation in the wrestling matches is considered a severe character deficiency, a betrayal of civic duty. They are matches and expeditions held every day. The community demands to know the relative formidability of each man, and these contests provide a low-cost way of revealing that information. Indeed, some psychologists have suggested that one reason, though not the only reason, that societies have independently developed athletic competitions is that they serve to advertise the physical qualities of individual males. Contests involving coordination, explosive strength, and physical prowess help to provide clear proxies for capability in hunting and warfare to male observers, and also provide information about romantic mate value to female observers. That is, sports can provide the functional equivalent of courtship displays. Gilmore notes that the tribal men engage in these daily contests largely for feminine approval. Success at beating other men translates into success in the mating game. Women frequently shout encouragement from the sidelines and express interest in the victors. A man who refuses or who regularly loses these contests experiences what Gilmore describes as social marginalization and an ever-dwindling status. Uh, yes, uh, women tend to wait at the finish line uh, and then mate with the victors. We'll speak more about status in a few moments, but for now let's concentrate on the title of the discussion, Understanding the male, Young Male Syndrome. The concept of this young male syndrome was developed by the psychologists Wilson and Daly, and it refers to a pattern of risk-taking behavior that is more pronounced in males in their late teens and early 20s relative to other demographic groups. The research that informs this framework suggests that this increased risk-taking is the result of both social and biological factors, including socio-cultural pressures and hormonal changes. For instance, testosterone levels for males increased by 800% on average at age 14. Um, Having 10 times the amount of testosterone as women, um, it's impossible for a woman to understand what it's like to have that in a male body. If you want to know, ask a woman who takes steroids and weight lifts. As one has said, she has no idea how we even make it to the day with this much testosterone um, and what it encourages us to do. And when we hear complaints from a lot of teachers in education about boys at this age, um, these teachers, often women, have no regard for this young male syndrome, have no idea how to teach or raise a man, and honestly are scornful of young boys for a situation they cannot help, whereas girls are given all kinds of extra um, conditions that allow for their emotional challenges, where men are told to just man up and suck it up. Back to Ken Dr. Henderson. The young male syndrome gives rise to competitiveness and a willingness to take physical and reputational gambles, especially when romantic partners, status, and territory are at stake. In psychological research, the young male syndrome has been linked with higher rates of aggressive behavior, substance abuse, reckless driving, and other potentially dangerous activities. Of course, this is a generalized pattern, and not all young men exhibit this behavior. Nonetheless, the sex differences are striking. A baby boy born in the U.S. has an astonishing risk profile. Men are three times more likely to die before age 25, three times more likely to become addicted to drugs or alcohol, and an incredible 19 more times likely to end up in jail. A man is more than twice as likely as a woman to have a car accident and three times more likely to be involved in two car accidents. Even when not driving, men are more careless. Twice as many men compared with women are killed simply crossing the street. Maleness is by far the biggest risk factor for violence. Men kill men massively more often than women kill women, on average 26 times more often. These patterns extend beyond the U.S. When data on violent crime are gathered from around the world, the result is utterly clear and amazingly consistent. Crime statistics from Australia to Uganda all exhibit the same basic pattern. In each of these societies, without a single exception, including Kenya, India, Iceland, Germany, Denmark, Canada, Mexico, Nigeria, Scotland, Botswana, Brazil, young males are by far the most likely to be the perpetrators as well as the victims of murder. 
Men get into fights more than women. They play more violent video games and watch more violent movies. They're more likely to be hospitalized for punching walls. They're more likely to fantasize about killing another person. They're more likely to actually kill another person, and they're more likely to kill themselves. In both the U.S. and the U.K., men are three times more likely than women to commit suicide. Globally, more than 90% of homicides are committed by men, and most victims of homicide are men, 70%. Interestingly, the figures for chimpanzees are nearly identical. 92% of chimpanzee killers and 73% of chimpanzee victims are males. Homicide is a crime committed mostly by young men from the U.S. to Japan and worldwide generally. Although contingent material and ideological conditions can exasperate or inhibit the tendency toward violence, the basic evolutionary foundations of this impulse are much older than humanity itself. Modern societies have, to some extent, managed to inhibit male aggression. Violent death rates among hunter-gatherer societies with little or no contact with Western culture exceed the murder rate recorded in contemporary America's most crime-ridden cities. In hunter-gatherer societies, roughly one in seven men die as a result of homicide. A global assessment of 31 hunter-gatherer societies found that 64% of them engaged in warfare once every two years. Such violent conflicts are carried out almost exclusively by men. In a 2012 paper, um, the authors wrote that if modern Western society had homicide rates as high as some foraging peoples, a male graduate student would be more likely to be killed than to get a tenure track position. To reiterate, for all societies for which there are data, the vast majority of violence is concentrated among men. The young male syndrome, of course, specifically concerns young men. In the US, a 20-year-old man is 10 times more likely to be arrested for a violent crime than a 60-year-old man. As mentioned, most of the targets are also young men. To this extent, the major trigger of young male homicides around the world are what social scientists refer to as trivial altercations. When they are put down by other men in public, nearly all young men will experience a flash of rage. Most manage to inhibit it, but some act to extinguish the source of their humiliation. For young guys, being respectful towards other young men is probably even more important than a healthy diet to ensure longevity. Violence and crime aside, the impulsivity of the young and the male can be observed in everyday situations. One study found that compared with adults age 55 and older, young males aged 18 to 25 are two and a half more times likely to uh, first reading uh, and send, send an email before reading it over. Moreover, 40% of women report they check their emails before sending them, whereas 25% of men do. To be sure, there are socio-cultural influences involved here, but environmental factors do not operate on blank slates. To understand young men and young women, you have to take into account not only the cultural context, but also evolved sex differences. Consider the claim that societies encourage males to be more aggressive. This is true in some ways. People, especially peers, often send the message to boys that they should be tough. Overall, though, we spend far more time discouraging male aggression compared with female aggression. Why? Because males are generally more aggressive. Or consider the claim that we tell girls to be quiet and passive. Again, we do this sometimes, but more often we tell boys to be quiet and passive. Why? For the same re reason. Boys are, on average, louder and more disruptive. Research finds that boys are punished more often and more severely for aggression. Overall, males are more aggressive despite culture, not because of it. And it's clear that there is uh, bias against males and heavy punishment in males uh, more so than females. I was once standing in an airport train on my way to another terminal. I saw a woman and her son. The son was about four. As the train began moving, he, she, asked the boy to hold on to the ran train handle. He replied, I want to serve. He then held his arms out as the train moved, attempting to hold his balance. I could see the mother was nervous and again firmly asked him to hold the railing. Despite her admonitions, the boy refused. He maintained his balance, though, and smiled, clearly pleased with himself at his own success. I have no doubt similar stories exist for young girls, but generally speaking, this type of risky behavior and obliviousness to the potential for physical harm is more common among boys. Researchers have found that the trait of what is called surgency, or high activity and impulsivity, shows a large sex difference with boys scoring higher than girls. These findings likely help to account for the fact that boys experience more disciplinary difficulties in school. A male bent towards risk-taking is partly, though not entirely, a function of environmental incentives and culturally driven socialization. The, biological, the biologist Hoven, who I understand is going to be a speaker at this series, points out that testosterone levels in men peak in their early 20s, and studies consistently show a correlation between testosterone and violence, as well as a correlation between testosterone and competitiveness. Testosterone, by the way, that they can't help that's in their bodies. These phenomena have an evolutionary basis in the ancestral human environment, young men had to stand out in order to obtain mates, a dynamic that long predates humanity itself. Over the past few decades, biologists have found that maleness and femaleness is rooted in something simple, how quickly the two sexes can reproduce. Biologists refer to this as the maximum reproductive rate. In short, the maximum reproductive rate for females is much slower than for males. Among humans, women are constrained to approximately 30-some gestations in their lifetime, 
assuming an extreme situation of near continuous pregnancy for both the ages 13 and menopause. In contrast, men can potentially father a far larger number of offspring. Look at it this way. An average man produces 255 million sperm. By contrast, women pr produce only 400 eggs in their entire lifetimes. Overall, an average, across an average man's lifespan, he produces 3.6 billion times more sick cells than the average woman. If you lined up one man's lifetime sperm production head to tail, it would circle the earth twice, while a woman's eggs would circle a ping pong ball once. To put it crudely, sperm is cheap and abundant, and eggs are expensive and precious. Thus, the producers of sperm compete to appeal to individuals who produce eggs. Males produce this massive overabundance of sperm in the hopes of offering it to females, but the vast majority of females are distinctly uninterested in what the vast majority of males have to offer. Females, on average, are choosier than males about whom they are willing to partner with, and so there is a sharp competition among males to stand out, to be favored, and to be chosen. This gives rise to increased conflict between males. To be clear, this competitive behavior doesn't necessarily occur consciously. Many human beings operate at a pre-attentive level. Most of the time, we don't hold an explicit mental model of how our behaviors might benefit us. We aren't always aware of how our actions might lead to an increased likelihood of obtaining resources or winning social allies or attracting romantic partners, any more than a spider weaving a web can visualize the end product that results from doing what comes naturally. The differences in propensity for physical confrontation have resulted in women in sexual dimorphism, or distinctions in physical form between men and women. For instance, the shoulders of boys and girls are of equal size until adolescence. At puberty, though, shoulder cartilage cells in males respond to testosterone, causing them to expand. Increased testosterone also results in the thickening of the male brow ridge and skull in order to withstand damage from attacks by other males. Plainly, in the ancestral environment, men with relatively thin skulls were less likely to survive violent encounters compared with men with greater bone density who were more likely to survive, find romantic partners, and produce offspring. The wider shoulders, larger arms, and greater bone mass of male humans appear to be the result of intrasexual conflict or male-on-male -male violence. Intriguingly, some evolutionary researchers have argued that human male secondary sex characteristics evolved not to attract females, but rather to compete against other males. Consider the example of beards. Why do males develop facial hair through puberty? Evidence is mixed about whether women find beards attractive. Some women say they do, others don't, and for others it depends, but there's clear evidence that men view other men with beards as more intimidating than clean-shaven men. Or take deep voices. Women, on average, tend to think deep voices are attractive, but in comparison, men are even more likely to find men with deep voices to be intimidating. The same basic pattern has been found for muscularity. Women find it to be attractive up to a certain point, but men report feeling threatened by large physicality in other males. Such research suggests that intersexual competition has given rise to male traits such as broad shoulders, large muscles, deep voices, and facial hair. Men evolved these traits, not so much because women find them sexy, but more so because other men find them intimidating. As a psychologist, Stuart Williams has written, secondary sex characteristics appear to be more like deer's antlers than peacock's tails. The peacock's tails evolved to attract female peahens, but male deer evolved antlers not to impress female deer, but to compete with other males. That same logic seems to apply to the characteristics of human males. Men developed specialized physical features for their specific process, purpose of intimidation and competition among other males. This is why guys often show each other show off before fights by puffing out their chests and expanding their arm muscles. You can observe this behavior during weigh-ins for boxing and mixed martial arts competitions. Males possess physical attributes and a psychological disposition that facilitate violence, as well as a physique that is uniquely equipped to withstand physical harm. In the ancestral environment, young men who were more adept fighters could deter other males from obtaining romantic partners and were often more successful in attracting partners themselves. Today, even in the peaceful uh, tribal society in Brazil, wrestling matches are organized to rank males by their capacity for violence. This brings us to a key question. What are the roots of the young male syndrome? Why do these striking sex characteristic differences in impulsivity, risk-taking, and violence exist? To answer these questions, we must understand the importance of social status. I'll use a definition from Cameron Anderson, who characterizes status as, quote, the respect, admiration, and voluntary deference individuals are afforded by others. When people defer to us or offer us respect, admiration, or praise, or allow us to influence them in some way, that's status. It is a resource as real as oxygen or water. As a, in a widely cited study, Cameron Anderson and colleagues found that sociometric status, defined as respect and admiration from peers, is a stronger predictor of well-being than socioeconomic status. Moreover, in a 2015 study, 
uh, across 123 countries, people's well-being consistently depended on the degree to which people felt respected by others. Attainment of status or its loss was the strongest predictor of long-term positive and negative feelings. Other studies have found that people report experiencing more envy towards people who are held in higher social esteem compared with people who have lots of money. Put differently, status is a stronger generator of envy than material affluence. Again, indicating just how important status is to people. It's as important as water or oxygen. The desire for status is often viewed as tawdry or unserious. Many people resist the idea that status is important, but, don't, but they don't resist equalist, e equivalent terms. If you say you want a job promotion for the status, you might be judged harshly. But if you say you want to be promoted because you want respect, that's often regarded as an appropriate desire. These two terms, though, mean roughly the exact same thing. To this extent, recent scholarship has found that status is far from shallow or unsophisticated. Indeed, it is complex and worthy of careful attention. Status is something that lives in the minds, lives in the minds of other people. This explains why researchers have found that when two men have an argument on the street, the presence of a third person, a witness, doubles the likelihood that the encounter will escalate from a verbal altercation to one that involves violence. The NYU professor of psychiatry, Dr. Gilligan, spent three decades studying the causes of violence and has found that time after time, men give the same answer as to why they assault or kill, because he disrespected me. In this context, disrespect essentially means that the target lowered or attempted to lower the aggressor's status. Psychologists have found that the social status can be broken down into two different types, dominance and prestige. Dominance is evolutionary older and more commonly observed among animals. Dominance in humans is associated with narcissism, aggression, and hostility. Under the dominance framework, status is attained by instilling fear in others through coercion, intimidation, and displays of brute force. Humans and other animals confer a status to dominant individuals because of what the individuals can do to them inflict costs, pain, humiliation, injuries, disfigurement, violence, reputation, destruction, and so on. As an example, Joseph Stalin obtained status through dominance. While dominance can confer benefits, it is often associated with instability and tension. In her illuminating book on pride, Dr. Tracy has written that dominant people pay for their less kindly road to status by incurring the dislike or even hatred of their fellow group members. And for many of us, this price is simply too high. We'd rather be low on the totem pole than be perceived as arrogant and domineering. And there's a second class of status, which is prestige. It is evolutionarily more recent and pervasive across human societies. Prestige is associated with stable self-esteem, social acceptance, and being well-liked. Prestige is freely conferred to individuals based on their knowledge, skills, or success. We confer status to prestigious individuals because of what these individuals can do for us. Provide us with benefits, teach us useful things, entertain us, grant access to resources, bolster our own status by being associated with them, and so on. As an example, the late physicist Stephen Hawking attained status via prestige. To be clear, dominance and prestige are not always entirely separable. In some cases, the two can be combined. For instance, depending on the political climate, military members and police officers are often considered to be both dominant and prestigious. There's a lot of variation across time and culture regarding how humans pursue status. Under a prestige framework, social rank is based on differences in skills and valued domains. Among hunter-gatherers, these include activities such as fishing, hunting, warfare, tool-making, navigation, storytelling, medicine-making, child-rearing, and so on. In industrialized societies, symbols of prestige include job titles, educational credentials, scholarly citations, luxury automobiles, or access to exclusive nightclubs. Because not everyone is equally talented in all valued domains, status disparities inevitably emerge. Compared to dominance, prestige offers rewards that are equally compelling or even more so. Prestige signifies a different and more positive sum form of social currency. In both non-industrialized and developed countries alike, prestige serves as an effective mode of acquiring status through skill, contribution, or specialized knowledge, rather than coercion or force. The core reason why our human ancestors cared about status and passed this desire onto us is because it will be directly tied to the ability to obtain critical resources, secure social allies, attract romantic partners, and ultimately the likelihood of producing offspring. Humans are not all equally kind, intelligent, healthy, ambitious, resourceful, attractive, empathic, generous, and so on. Men and women are not interchangeable in terms of their desirable traits. This variation gives rise to competition for desirable partners. Generally, men who accumulate status and power are not confined by institutional rules or strong social norms, have more female partners than ordinary men. As the Harvard biologist has written, if a male wins power, he will tend to use it to mate with as many females as possible. In most post-agricultural societies throughout history, such as the Aztec, Babylonian, Chinese, Egyptian, Inca, Indian, and Romans, harems of hundreds of women were the norms for kings, emperors, and pharaohs. 
The largest number of children that any man has ever had is 888. This individual was a Moroccan emperor, uh, Ishmael the bloodthirsty, who reigned in this era. Equivalently powerful women throughout history, such as Cleopatra, did not accumulate large harems of attractive young men. They could have, but they didn't. To be clear, not all powerful males view this, follow this specific pattern. Alexander the Great never showed more than a passing interest in women and fathered just a single child by the time he died at age 32, but Alexander bucked the trend. In a 2016 study of 33 non-industrialized small-scale societies found in human men's, men's status as indexed by wealth and political influences positively associated with several reproductively relevant outcomes, including numbers of sexual partners, number of offspring, and number of offspring surviving into adulthood. In modern societies, men who obtain high levels of income or occupational prestige are more likely to find a romantic partner and have children. A study from 2019 found that a man at the top of his earnings distribution has a more than 90% chance of obtaining a committed romantic partner. In contrast, for men at the bottom, less than 40% find one. In most societies, successful men try to convert their high status into reproductive status. And of course, the 40% who don't find one uh, are upset, angry, and who can blame them? Uh, and we have a lot of this in our society right now. So what are we going to do with these men? Back to the article. Of course, human culture is different and varied, and constraints on powerful men can inhibit their impulses. Warren Buffett and Bill Gates, who together possess more wealth than the bottom 50% of Americans combined, each have only three children. Elon Musk, currently the richest man in the world, is seen as prolific with 11 children in total, but his fertility is on par with the median woman in Massachusetts in the late 17th century. At that time, family sizes of more than 10 children were common in New England. To be clear, the quest for increased romantic opportunities is not the only reason why men seek status. The desire to attract women is often unconscious, with no direct link to the emotional systems that drive men to triumph in conflicts against their male competitors. Rather, men are inclined to seek status for its own sake, even in scenarios where local norms limit their ability to obtain multiple romantic partners. Acquiring wealth and status is intrinsically satisfying, even if it never leads to increased romantic appeal. Human males appear to have a general program installed that propels them to stand out among other males even if no women are present, as in the case in prisons. Besting others is often a reward in itself because in the ancestral environment, victory was so closely tied to reproductive success. Nevertheless, if given a contrived choice between material prosperity but permanent celibacy, or material impoverishment accompanied by abundant romantic interest from numerous women, the majority of young males will prefer the latter. In other words, most guys would prefer to be poor but romantically appealing than rich but romantically shunned. This discussion about status raises another important question. If men, to varying degrees, intrinsically desire status and its accompanying benefits, why are so many young men now disengaging from education and employment, two historically reliable paths to obtaining respect and admiration? Men now make up only 40% of college students, a gender gap that has been growing for decades. In the next few years, two women will earn a college degree for every one man. Today, one in six American men between the ages of 25 and 54 are unemployable or out of the workforce altogether. This is 10 million men, a number that's doubled since the 70s. There used to be an economic incentive to work, but in rich societies, this is becoming less necessary for survival. There used to be social incentives to work, but people are generally less apt to praise young men for working or condemn them for being jobless. There used to be romantic incentives to work, but a man with a job is less appealing than he would be in previous decades. Very few young men are inclined to expend the effort necessary to strive and improve and advance in education and employment without at least one of these external incentives. Moreover, today, men have an entertaining digital devices, video games, internet porn, and a variety of other avenues to facilitate and simulated status attainment and sexual gratification. As an analogy, many young men will not travel to the grocery store and then click a nutritious meal when they can satisfy their hunger by ordering fast food on Uber Eats. Ultimately, artificial junk food is less satisfying than real ingredients, but convenience, combined with the absence of external incentives to prepare a real meal, means that a growing number of individuals are opting for convenience and immediate gratification. Young males are inevitably going to try to obtain status, whether in the real world or in a digital world. But anthropological and psychological evidence indicates that people whom young males wish to impress, such as peers, high-status individuals, respected authority figures, and young women, have a lot of influence as to whether these activities confer status. 
If we don't want to see young men fall prey to the worst expressions of the young male syndrome, we must be intentional in guiding the avenues through which they seek status. If parents, caregivers, educationers, peers, cultural trailblazers, potential romantic partners, and other influential members of society overlook the important rules they play, then males will lack the guidance they need to opt into productive paths to prestige, and will either take the path to dominance or drop out of society by playing, playing virtual status games that have no real-world benefit or contribution. In his forthcoming book about his own life, the author enlisted in the military to redirect the bleak trajectory he was on as a teenager growing up in foster homes. The reason he made this decision was that two older men for whom he had a great deal of respect strongly recommended the option. One was his best friend's father, a veteran and retired police officer, the other his history teacher who had served in the Air Force before transitioning to education. Returning to the story the author opens with, his two moms, these two hardworking women who did their best to care for me under trying circumstances, were the first to introduce the idea of manhood to me as an achieved status that must be earned through effort and contribution. One core lesson I've drawn, both from my own unusual life and from a close reading of the relevant research, is that young males desire guidance and are deeply responsive to it. They yearn to know how to earn the cherished rewards of respect and admiration. The energy and ambition of young men can be channeled into positive directions. But if boys aren't exposed to positive examples of masculinity in their present lives, they will look for it elsewhere. In contemporary Western societies, parents, teachers, coaches, local community leaders, and other high status figures used to raise boys to become men, imparting lessons about personal responsibility, hard work, relationships, and obligations. Today, in the absence of young, such guidance, many young boys are being raised by viral TikTok influencers peddling deluded and ungrounded conceptions of masculinity. These people are grifters. High status individuals have a societal responsibility to guide young men towards constructive avenues for status acquisition. By doing so, they not only help to mitigate the risks associated with the young male syndrome, but also contribute to the cultivation of a more balanced and harmonious society. I'll leave it at that. Thank you.